Welcome, I'm Ann Gordon Curran, and I schedule the speakers for this series. Um, tonight, we have a team effort to discover a way through fam a family quagmire with significant cutoff and few facts about the family history. Dr. Susan Johnson Hadler, PhD in psychology, is presenting her journey as described in her book, The Beauty of What Remains, Family Lost, Family Found, published in 2015. Dr. Hadler's husband, the Reverend Jack Hadler Jr., is a retired Episcopal priest who remained somewhat active and learned about Bowen Family Systems work from Rabbi Edwin Friedman from 1984 to 1996. Mr. Hadler has applied family systems knowledge in parish ministry, coaching, clergy, and in spiritual direction. At the Virginia Theological Seminary, he used it as a framework to teach leadership and congregational development. With Dr. Hadler's intense desire to discover her father, who died in World War II when she was three months old, and to learn about, about, about both her maternal and paternal family histories, she pursued a 20-year search guided by her husband's experience and understanding of family systems thinking. Dr. Hadler also co-authored a book with Ann Bennett Nix called Lost in the Victory which broke the silence surrounding mention of fathers who died in World War II and how their deaths, the ultimate cutoff, affected their children. She has published articles in the Washingtonian, Reader's Digest, and the Mindfulness Bell. She has appeared in the Ancestor series of PBS. She formerly lived and taught in Tanzania, East Africa, and worked over 20 years as a psychotherapist in the DC area. The Hadlers have a son and daughter in the same sibling pattern as Dr. Hadler and her older brother, and they have three grandchildren. <laughs> Let us welcome Dr. Had Susan Hadler and her husband, the Reverend Jock Hadler, as they present on bridging multiple cutoffs, the process of uniting a family fractured by war, family feuds, and mental illness. Good luck. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Bowen Center. And um, thank you all for being here on this coldest of all winter nights. Um, I know we came through a little bit of snow earlier, and we're glad it didn't materialize. But it would be nice to have a snow day someday soon. Um, so I um, am going to talk about bridging family cutoffs and um, I want to begin by saying that almost everyone inherits some form of trouble from past generations. And when that trouble remains unattended to, it's likely to be passed down through the generations. <coughs> I was born into a family of missing people, the result of war, family feuds, and mental illness, all of which came from unspeakable pain in my mother's young life. Unspeakable, that meant silence, something no one can talk about. No one in the family could talk about it. No questions, no answers, silence. The it we couldn't talk about, as Anne mentioned, was my father who was killed in Germany in World War II, just after I was born and, and just a month before the end of the war in Europe. The it was also my mother's two sisters who were rarely mentioned and about whom I knew nothing, absolutely nothing, except their names, and that mother's younger sister, Dorothy, was married to a Brooklyn cop, which mother would say with a wave of her hand, which meant, don't ask, don't talk about it. Um, and Eleanor, her older sister, who had been sent to a mental hospital years ago. So if I can do this. If you, the changer is over here, so if you, this oh, is the way it changes. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, um, the first picture, my mother and myself in 1945, my father was um, already in Europe. And, um, oh, wait, I forgot the first one. This one. My mother and father in 1943, they were married in 1941. Um, and this is obviously before he went overseas. Longing to know my father had been with me forever. When I was born in January of 45, my father was stationed in a camp 
on the north coast of France, waiting to be sent to the front. And this is his picture. He was a camp lucky strike. There were a number, I think five cigarette camps named after cigarettes. Um, and another picture he is on the right. When he learned of my birth, he sent me a letter welcoming me into the family. And thankfully, my mother taped the letter into my baby book so that I could read it over and over. And I read it over and over as a child and uh, formed a, a durable, very durable connection with my unseen father. This is a copy of the letter, which was uh, Vmail. Because I was a baby when my father died, no one really thought I was or would be affected by his death. But every 4th of July, when we sang the na national anthem and I heard the words, the bombs bursting in air, I felt the thud of fireworks in my heart and thought of my father exploding to bits. Every Veterans Day, when I stood with my class for a minute of silence, I thought of my father, but told no one. Eventually, I learned that the silence had different meanings for my mother and for me. For my mother, I came to understand that silence meant protection from overwhelming sorrow and fear and, and a way to go on living. And for me, the silence meant family I longed to know trouble I wanted to understand, and pain I needed to heal. So when I was almost 50, after having a profession and raising my, our family, um, I began the complex process of bridging the cutoffs in my family. And the beauty of what remains, the book that I wrote, is the story of that process, which began with my search for information, about my father. In the beginning, my mother was the only person that I knew, I knew who had known my father, but my questions threatened to open her pain, and she responded with anger. I then began to search for, in, for confirmation that I was doing the right thing and found a compatriot and Antigone, the girl in Sophocles' play who defied the king's order against burying her brother who was killed in battle. The dialogue between Antigone and Creon, the king who was also her uncle, put words to my conflict and gave me the strength to continue to search for my father when there wasn't another source. Um, I, I looked for support in other places and was lucky to have a partner and good friends who understood my need for information about my father. When I attended a Veterans Day ceremony at the Vietnam Veterans Wall, I stooped to read a poem written by um, a, a child to a father who never came home. At that moment, I realized there must be others like me. So I called the local vet center for help and was referred to a, a woman, Ann Nix, who had recently started a network for American war orphans of World War II. When Anne and I discovered that nothing had been written and no statistics kept that illuminated the experience of American war orphans, the two of us collaborated to write Lost in a Victory, uh, which broke the silence um, about that situation. And it was a book of interviews with other World War II war orphans <coughs> and also included resources for locating information for our fathers. So, we wanted to help others who were in our similar position. Finding Anne and other war orphans was a turning point. As I realized I wasn't alone and I did not have to depend on my mother for information about my father. As I continued to, as I continued to search, more and more doors opened. My father's military records arrived burned on one edge due to a fire in the military, um, in the National Military Pers Personal Records Center. In this fire was in the 70s. But the details were still, le were still legible. And I read that he was born on July 17th, 1919. So I finally knew his birthday. 
um, and also that he was 25 when he died. The documents included a list of every article sent home after his death, including 20 pairs of socks. And if you were to look in my top dresser drawer, you would find a similar number of socks. So I began to identify with him, <coughs> picking out just whatever I could find that, um, where there were similarities. The more I found out, the more my questions multiplied. Was he funny or serious? What had he done before the war? And did I look like him? The vet center had given me the number of a man who organized reunions at his battalion, and my curiosity quickly overcame my fear of calling the men he served with, fear that they had forgotten or that they wouldn't want to talk about that time. The men welcomed my questions and told me stories that gave me a sense of him, of the person he had been. And I, and I found out he, was, he could be a bit mischievous like my older brother, and that he was also psychologically minded like me. Hoping to get as close as possible to him, I wanted to go to the places he last saw, and those places were in Europe. So Jack and I, Jack and I flew to France, where we began a month-long journey following the route of his battalion across France and into Germany. As we started out, we fought. We had only a few clues, but my own intuition was strong and I trusted it. Jack could either follow me or leave. And he chose to <laughs> Notice he's here. <laughs> but he chose to follow and his help was constant and fruitful. It felt as if the two of us were, at times, being led by my father. Miraculously, we discovered maps, one in a French tourist bureau and one in a German police station. The first map led us to Camp Lucky Strike, which I had no idea where it was before we started, where my father spent his last three months, and the other to a grove of trees in Western Germany where he was blown up by the anti-tank mine that he was trying to defuse, allegedly booby-trapped. We completed our journey in Europe with a visit to the American cemetery in Luxembourg, where my father's name is on the wall of missing, and you'll see it just above my head. Walking among the rows and rows of markers, if any of you have been to those cemeteries, with the names of men from every state in the Union, I became aware of the thousands of families who felt as bereft as my family. I belonged to an immense community who from time immemorial had lost a family in war. During the month we spent in Europe, I related everything I did and saw and felt to my father, and my relationship to and with him deepened. It was as if the small, silent well of sorrow inside grew and changed and became a strength and a way to connect with others across continents and across time. Ever hungry to continue my relationship with my father through those who had known him, Jack and I attended the reunion of his battalion and met the men who, with tears, told me stories that, in, and in, that I indeed looked like him. After that, I traveled to his hometown of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and met his childhood friends. The affection I felt from those who had known him enveloped me and helped me, helped me feel my father's love. They loved him and their affection came through to me. It was exactly what I needed to know that he had lived and that I was part of him. Finally, I was ready to give him the family memorial service that he had never had. Um, I had a marker installed at Arlington and invited my family. It was my mother and my older brother and myself. My mother and stepfather and my older brother and his wife came as well as our children and their friends and our friends. I expected to feel sad, but I felt triumphant. 
I was doing what needed to be done, something mother told me as we placed roses on his marker that she couldn't do. Her comment led me to realize that it takes generations to face into and begin the process of healing the effects of trauma. Mother was again furious when an article I'd written about my search was published in the Washingtonian and excerpted in the Reader's Digest. She cut off contact with me and the rest of the family closed in around her and left me outside of the family circle. I was devastated and I was disheartened that none of my six siblings stayed in contact with me. But I came to understand that my siblings and I saw our mother differently. They saw her as fragile and wanted to protect her. They also wanted to protect themselves from her anger. I saw my mother's anger as strength and I believed we could both survive. I also knew it was healthy to continue my search even in the midst of family condemnation. And I also thought of my children when I thought of that. I thought, this is something that they need to know, who these people are and what happened. We all need to know. <clears throat> During the almost four years of exile, Jack's support and knowledge about cutoffs and reactivity helped me stay in contact with mother through birthday presents, Christmas presents, and cards until I sent her a note acknowledging our mutual hurt and love. I included a recent photo of myself grinning like a five-year-old. She invited us to visit, and during that time, my younger brother mentioned my father. He was now a member of the family whose name could be spoken, and that was very important to me. When mother gave me her favorite portrait of my father, I knew a major family trauma was healed, and this is, if I had obeyed, if I had obeyed mother's wish to never speak of my father or search for him, I think our relationship would have stagnated. She could not open the door to grief by herself. And although I was unskillful at times, we found our way through our differences to a deeper understanding and shared love. Shortly after the visit, I turned my energy toward finding mother's sisters. We had never exchanged Christmas cards and I had never seen them in person. The only proof of their existence was a few photos in mother's album. Mother is the taller one. It's mother and her younger sister, Dorothy. And this is a picture, um, <laughs> the two of, them, it, two of them are hidden behind the bushes. And of course they were hidden in my life. They were hidden from me. And this is a picture, Eleanor is the tall one pushing the carriage. My mother is standing beside it and Dorothy is in the carriage. It's about 1924. I was curious and I was uneasy. I wanted to find out what they were like, to see if I looked like them and to find out why they weren't part of our lives. As a child, it worried me that I had aunts we never saw or heard much about. If I did something awful, would I too be banished? If I wasn't able to keep things going, like Eleanor, would I be rejected and sent away? If mother's sisters could be lost forever, I reasoned I could be abandoned too. And I was already halfway down the road to orphanhood with the loss of my father. The first clue about mother's sisters arrived when my older brother sent an envelope of family documents that included our grandfather's obituary. I was astonished to read the married names of mother's sisters and to find out I had six more cousins. As a result of my father's search, I'd met a professional genealogist and she gave me Dorothy's address and speculated that Eleanor, nearly 90, would be dead. I wrote to Aunt Dorothy and she called me the day after she got my letter. I'd grown up knowing only my stepfather's large extended family and now I found an aunt I shared with all of my siblings. Each had a different reaction my sisters had never heard of Dorothy and protectively did not want me to tell mother. My younger brother was eager to know his new cousins. 
The next time I visited Mother, I told her about finding Dorothy and that Dorothy wanted to be in touch with her. Mother let me know that she did not want to have any contact with Dorothy. They had feuded when Mother had asked for help after my father died and later over finances. I did not fully understand the intensity of their of mother's refusal and guessed that it had something to do with the sudden death of their mother when mother was 10 and Dorothy was six. But I was mercifully at peace with mother's wish, knowing that I could have that I could have a relationship with Dorothy and not mention it to mother. It took over two years of phone calls before Dorothy was ready to meet in person. When we did meet, the bond was instant and strong for both of us. Eventually, I met all four of Dorothy's children, my cousins, and developed a strong, close relationship with Mickey, Dorothy's oldest son. But the tendency to cut off, however, continued in Dorothy's family, as one of her sons is estranged from the family. Although we met, he later cut me off when he learned that I was in touch with them. My younger sister visited Dorothy, and she too saw Dorothy's likenesses and differences from our mother. Knowing Dorothy and Mickey brought forth in me a source of easy joy and a sense of belonging. The search for Eleanor lasted more than 10 years. Multiple obituary <coughs> and grave searches, I was searching for her grave, um, and I used various names and spellings, and nothing turned up for several years. The first useful clue came from another cousin I'd never met, mother's brother's daughter, with whom mother had, had stayed in contact. When Jack and I visited mother's hometown to poke around, I contacted my cousin and she invited us to dinner. After dinner, she brought out the family album and showed me a picture of a young boy. Johnny, she told us, was Eleanor's son. She said that Eleanor wasn't supposed to have any more children due to postpartum depression. Believing that Eleanor had schizophrenia, I dismissed, I dismissed my cousin's statement. When I next saw Mother, I asked her about Eleanor's child and learned that she, she also had a daughter. Mother told me that she recently tried to find Eleanor. She was worried that her sister was homeless, wandering the streets looking for her. So more than ever, I wanted to find Eleanor. The second clue came from Dorothy when I mentioned how much I'd love to know what happened to Eleanor. Dorothy was silent for a minute, and then she told me that Eleanor had been sent to a mental hospital in Maslin, a town close to their hometown. I immediately called the hospital, which was now an outpatient facility, and the man in the records department informed me that records were stored on little three by five cards in the attic in about 300 large boxes, and in about five years, they'd only gone through maybe 30 boxes. And they were not in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready to go and look and search. The next clue came just after my stepfather died, two years after mother's death. This, we siblings were gathered to distribute their few remaining things when my brother Dan held up our grandfather's Bible, and a note dropped out. He picked it up and read out loud, Eleanor to Maslin, December 7th, 1936. That was the clue that led to finding my 94-year-old aunt alive and well in a nursing home in Canton, Ohio. When I called the nursing home for the first time, the social worker told me a little about Eleanor. She tells jokes. Little things that make us laugh. She can be ornery, she speaks her mind, and she's cute. We love her. She calls everyone Dorothy. We call her mother. She wants to be called mother. She plays the piano and every night sings You Are My Sunshine. I was ecstatic. Jack and I planned to leave the next week to visit Eleanor. I made a photo album with pictures of the three sisters Dorothy had given me. Um, Dorothy's the youngest, my mother on the left, and Eleanor. Finding Eleanor opened many challenges. First, let me say 
that I fell in love with Eleanor. And you will too when you read about this woman who spent her entire adult life in institutions and survived with affection, intelligence, talent, and spirit. But finding her raised issues about my family's abandonment of her, I was shocked to know that my grandfather, who lived just 30 miles away, abandoned his child and that Dorothy, mother, and their older brother, Bill, had also left her there without so much as a visit. In those days, you weren't released until you had a place to return to. Eleanor's husband died of a heart infection the summer after Eleanor was taken to the hospital. By the time I found her, she had been institutionalized for 72 years hmm. for what I came to believe was an, was an episode of postpartum psychosis, which she probably recovered from within four or five years. I've had to examine my own heart and the effects of the tragedies the family experienced to, uh, to understand the way loss and unresolved grief, fear and lack of support and knowledge led, to the, led the family to abandon Eleanor. Again, I came to understand how wounded and paralyzed my family was at the time and how it takes a new generation to face into, to open up, to begin to untangle and to work through the effects of earlier traumas. At first, I resisted the attempt to find Eleanor's children. I was afraid they might somehow interfere with my deeply valued relationship with Eleanor. Eventually, I asked Eleanor if she had children. And when she answered, yes, Johnny and Sandra, and I love them very much, that was all I needed to try to find them. I met with a genealogist at the Maslin Library, and we spent the afternoon thinking through possibilities based on the limited information we had, and bingo. She found the telephone number for the one we were sure was our Johnny. This is Eleanor with Johnny. I called John out of the blue. Initially, he thought it was a hoax and threatened to call the state's attorney. <laughs> but I knew the magnitude of this discovery for him, and we were, we were able to connect. He contacted his sister, and Sandra called me the next day, as eager to see her mother as I was to meet her. Sandra told me how the cutoff with her mother had affected her. I was told, she said, that my mother was dead, or I thought she was until I was 12, and we went to visit our father's grave. And I noticed there was no grave for my mother. Clara, my father's sister who had adopted us, said, you don't want to know about that. The implication was that my mother or what happened to her was unspeakable. The ladies in the garden club told me she was mentally ill. John wanted to see mother when he was in his 20s. When he asked Grandpa Ben about her, he was told, the, ba the pages of that book are better left unturned. And John never took it farther. I also wanted to search for mother, but I was afraid I'd worry if it were schizophrenia. Somebody else might have it a child or a grandchild. Sandra flew in from Cape Cod the following day and her daughter, Eleanor's granddaughter, Amy, drove from Chicago. Sandra saw the mother she hadn't seen since she was five months old and Eleanor and her granddaughter met for the first time. And that's Eleanor and Amy in the back and Sandra. I forgot to take Eleanor's bib off before I <laughs> took the picture, but anyway. There she is. Um, when Eleanor died the next year, Sandra and I planned a memorial service, and four of my siblings and two of Eleanor's four children came. We told stories and got to know each other and more of the family history. Eleanor brought us back together and connected us. The following fall, all of my siblings and some of our children, and Sandra and her four children and their children, met for a few days together on Martha's Vineyard. We've continued to stay in touch, and I've heard from John's son and his granddaughter, who's a dancer, who told me that she now happily knows where her artistic abilities come from. I believe that each one of us in the family has come to see that bridging cutoffs gives us the extraordinary chance to revise our views of and our relationship with the missing people and with each other and with ourselves. 
It gives us the chance to understand and overcome the tragedies that separated us for so long, to see the family and ourselves more clearly and to know the wider family. I'm sure each of us feels as I do a deeper sense of belonging and wholeness, more rooted, stronger, and happier. What did I learn in the course of my searches? These seven <coughs> themes among others. First, oh wait, I forgot, um, huh, I forgot a photo. This is the family um, at Eleanor's memorial service. With families coming together for the first time. So the first thing I learned was that it's possible to change the present outcome of past sorrows. In my case, the traumas of war, family feuds, and mental illness. Delving into and coming to understand the intergenerational effects of these traumas for mother, for the family, and for myself has made me more accepting and free of the tensions of family secrets and prohibitions. I'm no longer a girl looking for her father. I know who I came from, the other half of me, and I have a more accurate sense of who I am. The lasting legacy of bridging cutoffs, of course, rests with our children and their children. So far, I've observed that our two children value and maintain their many connections with the wider family, with both their own and their in-laws' families. Second, Perceptions may seem true, but are simply the result of learning and conditioning. They are one person's or society's attempt to feel safe, to heal, or to make sense of something. And they may not be true for another person and may actually be harmful. I had to question many of the perceptions I'd grown up with before I could open the silence and begin my search for the lost. I was told to avoid pain, be happy and don't upset anyone. When I opened the silence, I too felt pain, but it was healing like a bone that aches as it mends. Slowly, what was hidden became full of life and meaning and connection. Third, I've learned that some of the most valuable assets to bridging cutoffs are asking questions, knowing that questions raise anxiety, patience and persistence, and keeping an open mind one that is willing to let go of old stories and admit new information and possibilities. <coughs> Fourth, I've learned the importance of keeping in touch with everyone, and especially those who've been out of touch with each other, and that has primarily been up to me, although Facebook has enabled my, sis my siblings and the cousins to stay in touch. This has not been easy, but necessary for the family to be and stay reunited. Fifth, finding the missing has shown me, in a sense, how I inherited an unfinished part of mother's life. Looking back, I now see that many of my life choices came from an unconscious awareness of and need to face into the troubles mother wasn't able to solve. As a graduate student, I worked with teenage mothers, young women who, like Eleanor, needed help with mothering. Later, I worked with runaways, many of whom had been rejected by families, by their families. Eventually, I became a therapist to understand the psychological forces at work in me, in my family, and in those who came for help. And I think Eleanor was a big part of that as well, wanting to understand what it was, what it meant to be mentally ill. Sixth, often in the course of my searches, what I'd imagined would be difficult or sad turned out to be healing. What struck me over and over and was stronger than the painful emotions were the moments of deep connection all along the way. When I saw tears in the eyes of the men who had served with my father and heard their stories, when I saw the bright eagerness in my mother's eyes when she welcomed me back into the family, when I saw Eleanor for the first time, and rather than rejecting a member of the family who had abandoned her, she placed her warm hand on top of mine. And seventh, the most surprising and encouraging thing I discovered is that what I was actually looking for, in addition to the missing people, was the love that had been lost in the cutoffs. 
I've learned that love still exists underneath all the hurts and tragedies and disappointments and can continue to grow even after death. 